Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, uh, on behalf of Ralph, I want to say sorry again for the uh, confusion with the technology. I was say, sharing a joke that in 2050, uh, this won't happen. All of this will be happened by, mach by machines. And the machines will tell us that this link will not work, you know, for Canada or for Uganda. You know, so it did not work for certain parts of the world. And that's why we needed to change it. And uh, between now and tomorrow, Ralph has to determine what he's going to do about it. Uh, because um, this particular link we are using will not be available tomorrow. But it's been a good leadership lesson, Raf. Um, that's how leadership is. It's not everything that we can, we can anticipate, uh, but there's a lot we can. And so we're going to talk about some of those things. Uh, I've entitled this Leadership 2050, uh, Different Climate, Same True North different climate, same true north. Um, you know what a climate is, right? An extended weather period. Uh, so the environment is going to be different in 2050, but some things will remain true. Some principles of leadership will not change because principles don't change. And that's the thing about true north. Anywhere else in the, anywhere in the world you go, north is always north. And a compass will always point you to north. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you are rich or poor, whether you are you speak English or not. True North is True North, you know. So some things will change, climate-wise, in 2050, uh, but some things will not change. And I will talk about both things. Um, I I happen to run a leadership development company that wants to see a flo a, a flourishing global ecosystem of authentic leaders. So you'd hear that quite a bit. Because uh, part of the trouble we have in the world now is that we don't have authentic leaders. Uh, people don't trust leadership, which is why people are not sure, should we take the vaccine or should we not take the vaccine? Should we trust education or should we not go to school? Trust is currency. And a lot of people do not trust leadership today. If that doesn't change between now and 2050, we're in deep trouble. So I want to see a, a flourishing global ecosystem of authentic leaders who are characterized by healthy growth, uh, holistic success, and lasting significance. So uh, one of my staff is with me here. Uh, Israel is originally from Rwanda. He lives in Uganda. And we, we offer authentic and customized relationships and resources uh, to C-level executives. C-level are, executives are those who are chief have chief before their names, right? So before their title. So chief executive officer, chief information officer, chief financial officer, that kind of thing. Uh, that's, that's our target, you know, for them to grow personally, succeed professionally, and then become significant corporately or, or society-wide. Uh, just before we dive into the material, I'll bring you greetings from my family. Some of you may have seen from my profile picture, I have seven children. So maybe I can teach you a little bit about leadership. <laughs> so leadership, what is leadership? And now there are over 360 official definitions of leadership. And interestingly, a lot of leadership books don't even define leadership. Uh, but we are going to define leadership right from the beginning in a way that is memorable, uh, in, in a way that will, be, will, be, will make an impact on you. Because although there are over 360 definitions, I find that this is, 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 a, is a, good, a good, succinct, definition of leadership. I'll expand it a bit towards the end, but this is the essence of what a leader is. A leader is a person who influences people to achieve a noble purpose. A leader is a person who influences people to achieve a noble purpose. So as you can tell, the three main P's in here, there's person, there's people, there's purpose. If you've noticed, we haven't said anything about position. We haven't said anything about power per se, but because influence is power. But leadership is not primarily about position. It's about people and purpose, all right? But all of it is within a certain context, right? And so, for example, I used to be a military captain and I, was, I, I served in Cote d'Ivoire during the time when Cote d'Ivoire was in civil war, you know, so... Uh, that's me and a couple of our Air Force officers, another Army officer. I lived in Cote d'Ivoire for a year because Cote d'Ivoire was in civil war and uh, they needed the UN troops there. So I went as a medical doctor uh, to, the, to the UN troops and the UN staff 
and, and the local people as well. Now, the kind of leadership I provided there is different from the kind of leadership I've done the last eight years, you know, as a president of a Canadian charity that works with international students. So these are some of my national staff that I work with as a CEO for eight years. And uh, they are from different parts of the world. Like, uh, you know, Johnson is, is from Hong Kong. You know, uh, this lady here is, is Suzanne is Canadian. Hilda here was, was, is Dutch, but was born in Brazil. You know, he is from uh, Colombia. She is from Singapore. Uh, she is originally from China, uh, Hong Kong and Thailand. She's from Vietnam. Now, that is global, the, 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 the nature of global leadership that we have today. You know, so you've got to learn something about intercultural leadership. We'll talk about that later on. But the point I'm making is that leadership is in a certain context. All right. So the way I led here is not the same way I lead here. And that is why it's important that we know the context we are going to be in 2050. Now, I use my little son, one of my children, as an example, because this young man loves pizza. But this is how ordering pizza in 2050 is going to look like. By the way, this young man may never learn how to drive because in 2050, we'll be having driverless cars. That has a lot of implications because, for example, it may mean that many of us can work longer, we can work more because we don't have to drive to work. All that time you spend in a car, it will be, you know, the car will be driving itself. But I have a funny story to tell. You can find this all over the internet. I can send it to you later on. But in 2050, this is an example of ordering pizza. It's going to be all by artificial intelligence. So this guy calls and he says, hello, is this Gordon's pizza? Then the response, the machine responds and says, no, sir, it's Google's pizza. They said, did I dial a wrong number? He said, no, sir, Google bought the pizza store. Oh, all right. Then I'd like to place an order, please. Okay, sir, do you want the usual? <laughs> the guy says, the usual? Um, you know what my usual is? <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the machine says, according to the caller ID, the last 15 times you've ordered a 12 slice, you've ordered a 12 slice pizza with double cheese, sausage and thick crust. Oh, oh, wow. The guy says, okay, that's what I want this time too. Then the machine says back, may I suggest this time you order an eight slice pizza with vegetables? No, I hate vegetables, the guy said, but your cholesterol is not good. How do you know? <laughs> well, through the subscriber's guide, we have the results of your blood tests for the last seven years. Guy is stumped. And he says, maybe so, but I don't want the pizza you suggest. I already take medicine for high cholesterol. And the reply is, but you haven't taken the medicine regularly. Four months ago, you purchased from Draxel Network a box of only 30 tablets. And the guy says, well, I bought more from another store. And then the machine says, it's not showing on your credit card, sir. I paid in cash, is the response. But according to your bank statement, says the AI, the artificial intelligence, you do not withdraw that much cash. I have another source of cash, is the response. This is not showing on your last year tax form, unless you got it from an undeclared income source. And this guy right now is frustrated. He says, enough already. I'm sick of Google, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, and all the others. I'm going to an island without internet where there's no cell phone and no one to spy on me. And then the machine responds and says, I understand, sir, but you need to renew your passport. It expired six weeks ago. <laughs> You know, it sounds funny, but it's serious. You know, welcome to 2050. So what I'll be doing is that I'll share certain things. I don't have, we'll have to modify our time because we, we unfortunately, we didn't start on time and we all have other commitments. I have another meeting also in, in a few minutes, in, in about an hour, sorry. So I'll, I'll shorten some of the things I was going to say. But basically, I'll be picking information, things from from arts and entertainment, business and science and technology, education, government, all these seven spheres of influence or cultural, uh, spheres of cultural influence um, and, and say and give you an idea what 2050 is going to look like, all right? And by the way, every one of these centers is important, including religion, and I'll mention that because a lot of people think religion, we're going to have less religion in the future, but we're actually going to have about the same or even more religion, and I'll show you how. So this is 2050, the world in 2050, all right? Um, I have an interesting home. Uh, my dad, 
I have a dad and sister who were both part of the big four, you know, the big four accounting firms in the world, you know, so KPMG, uh, Ensign Young, PwC, and uh, what is the first one, the fourth one? I forget, but I have a father who was with KPMG and a sister who is with Pricewaterhouse, PwC. Now, PwC has done a lot of research into this. And in 2050, the world economy is going to be double its current size. I know some of you are economic students uh, like Raf, all right? The world economy is going to be twice the current size, far outstripping population growth due to technology-driven productivity and improvements. Now, as a result of this, the so seven largest economies in the world are actually going to be emerging economies, including China, number one place. India will be number two place, kicking the US out of second place. And Indonesia will be number four, okay? Um, the UK will be down to the 10th place in 2050. France that will be out of the top 10. Italy will be out of the top 20, all right? And they will be taken, overtaken by economies like Mexico, Turkey, Vietnam, all right? But emerging economies need to enhance their institutions and infrastructure significantly if they're going to realize long-term growth potential, if this is not going to be just a flash in the pan, all right? And, and this begs for leadership, all right? So this is how the global economy is going to look like in 2050. As you can see, uh, five years ago, you know, this was the order, you know, the majority of the, of, the, of the top 10 were G7 countries. Guess what? In 2050, the majority of the top 10 economies will be what is, what, what is called E7 countries. China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, Russia, Mexico, and Turkey. So if you look at it in 1995, you know, the, 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 the G7, the, the E7 was just half of the G7's total GDP. But by 2015, they were about the same. But by 2050, the E7 will, out, will be, could be double the size of the G7. All right, very significant. Now, I find this interesting because most of us are calling in from Africa and you see the big players here, all right? China, US, the EU, India. Unless we take the Africa seriously, this Africa continental tree, you know, free trade area seriously, Africa will not feature on this map. Nigeria will have moved from 22nd place, you know, today to the 14th place, moving eight places up. But it will still not be able to compete in the top 10. So right there, we have a leadership lesson, the need for our Africans to come together. And because if you look at this, the EU is being seen as one place. We have to have China, we have US, we have EU, all right? Why don't we have AU on this, but rather we have Nigeria, all right? So right there, we have a, a leadership thing. You guys are the leaders of tomorrow. Right now, begin to press on our current leaders that we need this Africa, this Africa that we want. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a choice. It's, it's imperative if we're going to have any punch in, 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 the, in the age to come, okay? Um, that is a leadership issue. To, to, to see the Africa that we want. Um, so in 2050, uh, the world's population will be 9.8 billion. And uh, who is going to lead all these many people? In 2050, what do we see? Ha, huh. India, Nigeria, Pakistan, DR Congo, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Indonesia, Uganda will be just eight countries constituting half of all the human population growth between now and 2050. So if you're looking at growing leaders, Raf, look at these places because these places will have the most population growth within the next, between now and 2050. How strategic to raise leaders in those countries now. Well, 2050, what do we see? Almost 70% of the world is urban, which is very significant. Because it's only in 2008 that we crossed 50% of the world's population being urban. But by, by, by 2050, nearly 70% of the world's population will live in cities. Now, this is important because mega cities, cities with millions upon millions of people, will literally be determining 
the economic, cultural, and political issues in the world. So, you know, mega cities more than nation states will be the dominant global force. So it will not just be, okay, Nigeria has done this. You know, it will be Lagos has done this. New York, you know, has started that, you know. And look at, look at the top 10 mega cities. You know, there are two African countries on the top 10. About four of them are Indian, Indian, Indian cities. But we have Lagos on that list. And so do we have Kinshasa. Let me tell you something. Uh, I'm not sure I'll get through all my presentation, but let me tell you something. If we are serious about leadership, African leadership into 2050, into the future, it is not possible without Nigeria and DRC. Those two countries need to do well. Those two countries will need solid leadership if Africa is going to go anywhere. No matter how well Africa does, if those two countries don't do well, they'll drag all of us down. So remember that. So look at this Zoom call. We're calling from all of us. Somebody said they're calling from South Africa and all of that. Guys, we've got to think beyond Accra, think beyond Ghana, think beyond Lagos, think continental, since I see most of us are Africans on the call. So cities are now going to contain not just people, but they are going to be centers of economic, cultural, and political influence. It's 2050. What else do we see? Human lifespans are increasing, right? Human birth rates are declining. Less people are having more children, you know. Uh, the average age of a human being is getting older and older, as you can see from the graph. You know, the average age, no matter where you are living, the average age in 1950 would have grown significantly, almost twice by 2050, all right? Give you an example. Um, in the 1980s, there were around 100,000 people who were aged over 100 years old. But by 2050, it is predicted that there'll be 4 million, 4 million people will be over 100 years old by 2050. 4 million, all right? So, and, and such changes are gonna have massive effects on employment issues, retirement age, pensions, the cost of and duration of medical care for the elderly, but most importantly, since we're talking about leadership, who will lead who? in 2050, when you have more than 4 million people over 100 years old. Genetic you know, engineering is gonna happen so that some genes are gonna be taken out that make us sick, that make us age. 2050 is gonna be incredible. But this next slide should shock you because there's still gonna be, there's gonna be increasing gap between the rich and the poor. Again, unless some drastic things are done between now and 2050, this is what it's going to look like. We've actually made a lot of amazing progress in reducing poverty around the world. Only about 10% of the world lives in what the UN call extreme poverty right now. Of course, COVID-19 has changed things. The statistics may change a bit, you know, and all of that. But this increase between the rich and the poor is going to cause a lot of conflict. Uh, so what happens when you have one set of countries you know, with the most wealth, but a declining population, which is mainly the Western countries. And then another set of countries which are poor, but they have the youngest and the fastest growing population. What's going to happen in the world? 2050, we think, if you think migration issues are important now, it's going to be even more front and center. We're only experiencing the tip of the iceberg now when it comes to migration issues. 2050, I'm going to round up shortly because I want to ask you to tell me what are the areas we would need leadership in, all right? 2050 data drives everything, all right? More than ever, our lives will be driven by data. It's a mixed blessing because, you know, um, data will show us which movie is going to get more sequels. You know, data will show us which, 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 which grocery store, you know, would be going to. Data will tell you, will make you decide, decide who are your friends because they, you know, these trends will, would, would, would determine on social media. I mean, through social media and all of that, you will get to be fed the information that you want and be connected with the people that you like. It's going to be problematic because we're going to be in these bubbles where you only hear what you want to hear. But it's, it's a, so it's a mixed blessing, but data is going to drive everything. All right. Um, Religion is still going to be important. By 2050, 
87% of the world will still be religious. And there's something very important here because a lot of people, this is contrary to popular secular opinion that the world is becoming less religious. No, it is not true. Um, actually, at the same time, the world is going to be still religious, almost 90% of the world. Fundamentalism and radicalization is going to rise up. All right. So there's going to be a, a, a dance between modernity, globalization, secularization, pluralism. Okay. This is very interesting because there are going to be almost as many Christians as there are Muslims globally. Um, and so what does that mean for leadership? I mean, that means that any leadership cannot leave religious uh, people out. Any leadership training will have to consider religious groups. You know, Christians will have to respect Muslims. Muslims will have to respect Christians because guess what? It's going to be almost half-half in 2050. By the way, there'll be more Christians in Africa than the next two continents combined, than Europe and Latin America combined. So it's going to be a very interesting world. If we do not have solid Christian leadership and solid Muslim leadership, that both seek the good of society. All right? Not just the good of their religion, but the good of society. That is critical. All right? One last thing, and then I'm going to ask you, what are the areas you feel we're going to need leadership in? And then I'll tell you what kind of leader you've got to be by 2050. So we're going to have what is called a VUCA world. Now, VUCA is something that was, was, was invented a couple of decades, decades ago. It means volatility and ambiguity. Sorry, volatility, um, ambiguity, complexity, all right, um, and uncertainty. So V, volatility, U, uncertainty, C, complexity A, ambiguity, all right? We're experiencing even right now with a bit of the COVID-19, but it's going to be so much more of a fast-paced uh, VUCA world coming. Unprecedented change, unprecedented complexity, unprecedented uncertainty, unprecedented ambiguity, but also unprecedented opportunity. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a school of thought that has come up with something called VUCA Prime. In other words, for every one of these four things that the world is going to be, we can be a certain kind of leader to be able to tame that 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 phenomenon. So, for example, uh, and, and we, I can send some of this stuff to you so that you can you can take your time and learn. Uh, so, for example, instead of volatility, vision. If you have if we're leaders with vision, it counters volatility. When you have clear purpose and tangible vision of future organizational direction. You know, that is understood by everyone, but this vision still remains flexible because things can change, you know, and how you get there remains flexible. But when there's clarity of vision, it can overcome volatility. Then when it comes to the you, understanding can overcome the uncertainty. What I've done in the last 10 minutes is actually to give you an understanding of the context of 2050, all right? Because the more we know, the more we understand, the less we feel things are uncertain. What about C? complexity. What we need is clarity over complexity. And this clarity is not because you know uh, everything, no, but you are very clear about who you are, you know, and what your purpose is as a leader. All right. And then for, for, for uh, ambiguity, you need agility, the ability to be agile, all right, to be, to be adaptable, to be fluid, all right. And, and to be distributive of your leadership. You are not just the head leader. You have all these other leaders you are working with. So that alone, for me, this alone is a big enough lesson in what kind of leadership will be needed in 2050. Visionary leadership, visionary leadership that has understanding of the times of the context, leadership that has clarity, and leadership that is agile or adaptable. That is the kind of leadership that is going to be needed in 2050 when we have a VUCA world. So I want to go back to the definition and then throw this question to you. If a leader is a person who influences people to achieve a noble purpose, then in 2050, what are some of the noble purposes you feel based on the information I've given you about the way the world is going to look like? What are some of the noble purposes you feel will have to be pursued by leadership? Anyone chime in? And then I'm going to give you some characteristics of the kind of other characteristics of the kind of leadership we, we need to... Oh. Yes, who's speaking? Hello. Yes, sir. Um, kindly repeat the question again. So in 2050, I've shared with you how the world is going to look like economically, demographically, and in other ways. 
So you probably have heard of some exciting opportunities or some significant challenges that 2050 is going to bring. So if a leader is a person who influences people to achieve a noble purpose, what I'm asking is, what are some of these noble purposes that you feel will have to be pursued in 2050? And whatever noble purpose you come up with, we will need, we'll need leadership, influencing others to make it happen. Anyone? Um, yes, sir. Can you introduce, just mention your name and then go ahead. Okay, my name is Mada, M-A-A-D-A, Mada. Mada, okay. Mada, M-A-D-A. Yeah, so I think the most important or the most noble of purposes that have to be achieved in 20, by 2050 is unification of African states. Ah. As you, yeah, as you stated earlier, you presented um, some data where we have EU. That's right. But there is no African Union. That's right. And you also stated that um, for Africa, for, the, um, for, for, for Africa to grow, by 2015, I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember your exact words, but you, yeah. I get the idea of what you said. You said Nigeria and DRC have to be greatly involved. And yeah. if they don't evolve, they will drag all of us down. Now, the purpose here will be hmm. to create this unity, this unification of African states. That is, if Nigeria is going up, hmm. it will drag others with it. And if hmm. Congo is going up, it That's will drag right. others with it. Oh. And since over the past years, I know that there is a body that labels itself as African Union. No offense. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. But if you look at the state of Africa right now, the societal norms, yeah. it's almost non-existent. So by 2050, the noblest of purpose that we can mm. achieve is the mm. true unification of African states, wow. where Africa can be identified as one, just like the EU. Wow. Awesome. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. I'm telling you, if we left here with just that purpose, that we all are going to learn and study to become the kind of leaders that will bring about that unification, that alone will be worth this meeting and all the troubles we have had with technology trying to get into this meeting. So thank you. You've given, you've given us one noble purpose, you know, one noble 2050 purpose, the unification, true unification, functional unification, not just on paper and not just an idea of all African states, all right? So from what you heard, anything else which will be a noble purpose, you know, worth achieving in 2050? I didn't talk much about, tech, uh, you know, uh, climate, but we would have, would have to develop new green technologies, all right, to ensure long-term global growth in an environmentally stable manner. That is a noble purpose, right? Green energy. So that is somewhere we need some of you. I don't know what you're studying in university, but we need leaders. We need strong African leaders in that, okay? Um, we're going to need uh, the, the, a noble purpose of that the potential benefits of globalization are shared more equally across society so that this, this gap, the dis disintegration of the middle class, the dissolution of the middle class and the increasing gap of rich and poor, you know, doesn't continue or it doesn't even happen in 2050. There's a likelihood that people will slide into protectionism, you know, which, which is bad for global growth in the long run. Protectionism being, yeah, you know, like just have, what happened with Brexit. We want to watch out for just, Bre you know, Britain or what was happening with the U.S. in the Trump era. We, you know, America first. We want to watch out just for America. We need leaders who are going to say, hey, strong enough leaders who are going to say, just like Africa unites, strong leaders who are going to say we need, nobody is safe, nobody is going to be well or healthy or wealthy if we all don't come together and help each other, you know. So those are some purposes I can think of. Can anybody else share, you know, one or two other noble purposes that we will need leadership for in 2050 from what you've heard about the context? Um, I think there is a hand raised. Yeah, go ahead. I, I'm not seeing everybody. So yeah, Ralph, you help me with this. Yes. So call the person. Hopefully, she can speak. 
Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, my name is um, Cornelius. So um, I'm from University of Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, the noble impact I would like to talk about is um, concerning the health sector. Uh -huh. So um, um, was it last year, for instance, um, the world was attacked with um, the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So um, looking at the way um, development will be in um, 2050, it means we should be expecting um, something um, we, you know, the more um, there is development, it means um, there will be a lot of maybe uncertainties as well. So mm. we need leaders who will be able to anticipate um, mm. certain um, unexpected um, situations like maybe pandemics and okay. other, um, yeah, so that we make um, provisions down for, um, yeah, okay. so that's what I want to do, yeah. Excellent. That's a great idea. That's a great noble purpose, right? So, for example, even in the U.S., in Obama's time, they, they anticipated that in the next few years, there's going to be some kind of, you know, um, health hazard, how, you know, global health issue, because we had had issues with SARS, you know, we had had issues with Ebola and all of that. So what Cornelius is saying is that one noble purpose that would need leadership is for us to have a comprehensive, you know, a strong group of leaders, a comprehensive plan you know, to, to, to counter possible future pandemics. You know, that, that is awesome. You guys are brilliant. You're really exciting me. You're really, really exciting me. You know, great. Maybe let's have one more noble purpose. And then I'm going to tell you some of the differences between 20th century leadership and 21st century leadership. What kind of leaders we ought to be. And then we'll round up. One more person. What other noble purpose? Do you feel we need leadership for? By the way, increasingly in the future, since machines are going to take over a lot of functions, all right, increasingly management functions will go to machines. But leadership yeah. will have to come yeah, to machines. Okay? Now, there are many differences between management and leadership, but a simple way of looking at it is management is doing things right. So everybody's at work at 8 o'clock, you know, everybody's paid on the 28th or the 30th of the month, you know, doing things right. But leadership is doing the right thing. Leadership is determining what is right. So we would need leadership to determine for our human race what is right in the first place. And then machines can take over and keep doing what that right thing is. You hear what I'm saying? So we're going to need leadership so much more than even management. Because machines can do management, but we need human beings to lead. Okay. Somebody wanted to speak. Um, was it was it Julius or was it? Uh, I see a hand up. Yes, Ralph. Let the person speak, and then we can move on. Yeah, Jeffrey, please, you can speak. Hello. Yes, Jeffrey, go ahead. Uh, my name is Jeffrey. Uh, I'm from another economic sector. Yes. Uh, we need to formulate or execute good, better policies to achieve higher standard of living. Mm. Uh, so in twenty, yeah, in twenty fifteen, we need to. There must be policies that will help raise our standard of living so that it can help better our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, awesome! That's great, fantastic. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. So he's saying that noble purpose is raising the standard of living of our people. And it takes leadership to do that. It's not machines that are going to do that. Leaders are going to tell machines what to do. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. I see uh, um, who else is see there. That. Okay. Go ahead. I can see that. Yeah. Um, um, hi. Okay. Sorry. No, it's, it's okay. Um, hi. I'm, I'm Laika. Um, one of the noble things I think that we should also work towards is educating the youth in mm. terms of the 4IR. So like the fourth industrial revolution. So mm -hmm. um, I, I'm with, I'm studying IT. So I'm really mm. like mm. in terms of um, information technology, yes. coding and stuff like that. That's right. And that's the way the future is going. Yeah. And I do think that as South African, I mean, as Africans on this continent, yeah. we can um, utilize this and 
if we develop skills in our youth that yes. will um, like as much as education is extremely important we should mm. start educating our youth rather ju- yeah. not just of what yeah. was yeah, what it used to be like please sorry no she hasn't finished her point yeah finish your point please okay thank you no 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 go um, ahead i, I thought i got no go ahead you were saying okay. that instead of just general education we should focus on just general on... education also focus on yeah also add into the the fact that we should teach um the youth about coding and how oh, right. to code and coding knowledge because Excellent. that's what's going that's what's going to happen in the future that's what's going to be required in the future that's going to be a basic skill that most people will have to have that's especially right. in 2050 because um a lot of the stuff that we do now yeah. that we automate can be simply done coded in maybe a week and that's then right. humans will be replaced with yeah. that with that technology that's right so uh, rather than making for example people that just follow the rules mm-hmm. uh, a robot can just follow the rules <laughs> exactly. have people that make the rules that's right that's right for the robot to follow that's right excellent <laughs> i love that I love that and just to just to encourage you uh, my wife and I run a, an online library we have with about 2, 2000 children in Ghana and and um, yes on Saturday we got you know one of the leading teachers of STEM you know um to come and talk to the children about coding because she codes right and then then on, that was Saturday and then on Sunday we got a young man a 20 year old man who has been coding all these apps you know he learned them from scratch from YouTube you know and been building all kinds of apps some of the apps help farmers to identify diseases in their crops etc and and we're talking to little children encouraging them to learn to start learning coding so great noble purpose getting every african not just to be computer literate but actually to get coding i love that i love that okay i saw there were a number of hands up uh, maybe we'll take two Hello. more and then we will talk about what kind of leadership we will need to make this happen yes okay good evening good evening yeah my name is ns hf a yes, student NS. of GC, gct what is gct yeah uh, first gct you see now gct dana telecom university all ah, right all right excellent yeah, yeah. okay talking about noble purpose for 2050 i think um as covid has you know shown a little or has displayed how a country should be prepared mm. for future events i think um our product or our production firms to increase the value added in terms of adding value to raw products as recently mm. in the news the vegetable farmers were complaining about their products gotten rotten because the their flights were cancelled i think we should do more when we have production firms or we have manufacturing firms that can change raw or products from the farm to you know some medium or yeah. semi finished goods i think That's that would right. really help yeah awesome. africa yeah. awesome value adding you know yes please. yeah excellent so we you know things don't rot because we can't add any value we're waiting for flights you know that's awesome that's awesome All right. So it, this will be a great exercise to continue on your own. What are the great noble purpose? Now if you look at the all the millennium development goals for example, right? You know, every one of them is a great purpose. All the MDGs, right? These are all great purpose of course. We are hoping that that by 2030, you know, but take a look again, watch the recording, look at the statistics, look at stop the recording, look at the slides of some of the things I shared will happen in 2050. and think of some more noble purposes that we will need leaders to influence other people to make happen now what kind of leadership are we going to need well, one of my mentors he teaches at harvard um, he used to be the ceo of medtronic his name is will george actually he has a number of books uh, this is one of his books called discovering your true north um, i have i have a couple of his books here and he talks a lot about authentic leadership he's saying that 20th century leadership is going to be much different from 21st century leadership you know so 2020 leadership i mean 2050 leadership is going to be this way now when it comes to image 20th century leaders it was about being charismatic you know but 21st century leaders 2050 leaders are going to be purpose driven when it comes to focus 20th century leaders focus a lot on their own country but 
you guys coming up, you 2050 leaders, you've got to have global vision. You're right. And we've had, we've learned a hard lesson today because the, 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 the Zoom link we were using was not allowing people to join globally, only people to join locally. So that's a lesson right there. All right. A lot of motivation in 20th century leaders, especially in industry and in business, was self-interest. But in 21st century, leaders ought to have institutions' best interests. All right. And then, oh, this is important. When it came to, comes to experience, 20th century, people wanted a perfect resume. It's like this guy is the perfect boss. But you know, you younger leaders, you Gen, 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 Gen Y and Gen Z, you love authenticity. And so 20, 21st century leaders are going to not, have, not be perfect. We're going to make mistakes and all of that, but going, we're going to learn through those crucibles. We're going to learn through our mistakes. All right. And that is just fine. All right, so don't try, don't think you're going to need to be perfect to be a leader in 2050. You've got to be a, you've got to be a learner to be the best leader in 2050. That's what you've got to be. All right, when it comes to time frame, a lot of 20th century leaders were short termists. Uh, 21st century leaders got to think long term, especially when it comes to the environment. Okay, um, and then when it comes to organizational approach, uh, 20th century leadership was very hierarchical, right? So CEO, you know, deputy CEO, whatever, CFO, whatever, very hierarchical. But in 21st century, it's got to be not just flat, distributed leadership. This is a good one. The greatest strength of 20th century leaders was IQ, right? It's like when you are smart, you get to lead everybody. But guess what? Machines are going to be smarter than us. That, that's what, that's what uh, our lady from South Africa was saying. Machines are going to be smarter than us. You know, when I say 2 million times, 4 million times, 7 million times, you can't do it, but a calculator will do it in a millisecond. So in the 21st century, what matters in your leadership is EQ, is emotional intelligence, the ability to be self-aware and manage yourself, especially your emotions, and be aware of other human beings and how to manage your social situations. That will be way more important EQ than IQ. Machines will be smarter, but not wiser. We need human beings who are wise, not just smart. We need human beings who can discern. We need human beings who are compassionate, right? Because machines cannot be compassionate. They are made of silicon and, and metals, other metals and things like that, right? Now, this is a very important point, what I'm going to talk about next. Because in 21st, the kind of leader you're going to be, you need to be in 2050, is leader as coach and facilitator. Now, I'm going to spend a few minutes on talking about this and then I'll round up. A leader as coach and facilitator. Now, I'm a coach. I'm an executive coach. I coach CEOs, you know, uh, like I told you at the beginning, and, uh, and C-level executives. Now, the best tool of a coach is questions. The age of the all-knowing leader will be gone by 2050. The best leaders will be leaders who ask questions and not search for answers or leaders who need to know everything. Because guess what? You just have to Google. We all get the answer. In fact, we don't even have to press anything. We probably some of the you know machines will be attached to our bodies, or we blink an eye, and like on my on my on my glasses right now, I could I could be scrolling with my eye. You know, so <laughs> we don't need an all-knowing leader because he would know everything, and but but everybody would know everything because we'll all be on the internet and things like that. So with technological advances, answers are becoming a commodity, a common commodity as we search the internet and use Google to find answers to almost anything with ease. In the future, successful leaders will be those who know how to ask the right questions and also know where to get their answers from. Asking the right questions will be the most important thing. That's why we say you good leaders will have to be coaches, people who ask questions. But also, great leaders of the future in 2050 will be the best facilitators in a virtual world. They will connect people and ideas. The greatest leaders are going to be the greatest connectors of people and ideas, right? Not telling people what to do and how they should be working, all right? Because that's not future generations of employees will expect to be treated as leaders because everybody wants trust and autonomy and independence. So you're not going to be bossing people around and telling people what to do, but you're going to be able to connect people, connect people and ideas as a facilitator, as a connector. Command and control leadership will be seen less and less and will eventually be, be phased out. 
if your idea of leadership is command and control, you're going to be like a dinosaur. You are going to be evolved out. Now, the last thing I, I want to share is, uh, last but one thing, is that there are going to be paradoxes of leadership. You know what a paradox is, right? It was something that seems to be opposites. Uh, PwC came out with these six paradoxes of leadership, but I myself have been thinking for a long time, and I shared on, on LinkedIn yesterday to Dr. Excel and uh, uh, others, that as I, as I think about leadership in 2050, how leadership in 2050 is going to look like, you know, there's, that, there's no going around the necessity for leaders to embrace tension and paradox. Okay, so I like the sixth list of PwC uh, because number one, we've got to have leaders who have the confidence to project a clear strategy, but also have the humility to correct course. So we need humble heroes. Do you see the irony there, the paradox there? We need humble heroes as the kind of leaders for 2050. We need secondly leaders who are sharp at surveying the landscape from a big from 30 feet, right? you know the big the big idea the big the big picture all right but at the same time can function and ensure that operations happen on the ground so we need strategic executors for the 2050 kind of leadership 2050 kind of leadership these leaders must remain rooted in traditions i told you about true north right but at the same time or embrace innovation you know so we need traditioned innovators for 2050 we need leaders who can consider what they need their workforce to achieve and then effectively use technology as our sister from south africa was saying to achieve it so they so we need we need technology savvy humanists because humans got to determine the right things and let machines do what machines can do best all right this is important we've been talking about it over and over again we need leaders who are who think globally while acting locally globally minded localists and finally we need leaders in 2050 who have the ability to negotiate different viewpoints and bring to a, things to a consensus like i told you by 2050 we're going to have about almost 50 50 christian muslim in the world like almost about almost almost about the same how are we going to live in a world like that we need people who are high integrity politicians who can negotiate different viewpoints towards a consensus while remaining faithful to what they believe in, while remaining integral. Okay, so Peter Fusey calls this a sophisticated leadership that we need for 2050. I call it, I say we need deep leaders and I'll define what it is and then I'll round up. I say that a deep leader is a person who is ethically responsible, compassionately serves and authentically influences people towards a shared noble purpose. So it's not just a noble purpose, it's a shared noble purpose. Because you may say it's a noble purpose, right? But if it's not shared, the people don't share in it, then you are not, you are being dictatorial. You know, you are not, that's not the kind of leadership we need in 2050. But these kind of deep leaders, they rightly discern the times and are adaptable. They embrace contradictions, they tame tensions and struggle paradoxes. Their passionate knowledge-based and skillful approach to leadership flows out of a self-aware, emotionally healthy, and spiritually attuned core, resulting in profound transformation to the individual, to the teams they work with, and society for the long haul. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes deeply transformed leaders to deeply transform society. We have a problem in Africa, especially around the world, but especially in Africa, where people who have not been deeply transformed think that they can change society and they get into lead positions of power and destroy themselves and destroy the rest of society too. I want to leave you with something, a couple of things you can do to become this kind of leader that we've talked about by 2050. So I have a leadership development organization that I run called the HUD Group, the Human Development Group. I started it when I was still in medical school. And uh, so when I, I was talking to Ralph and I was telling Ralph that he reminds me a lot of myself. You know, because when I was his age, I was also running around trying to organize programs and things like that. So we've been running for about 18 years and we work now in about 24 countries. Now, when we started, we we're very gung ho, you know, all like, yeah, let's go, let's show people how to discover their God given purpose and reach their full potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we, we missed some basic steps. And I want to introduce you to one important basic step that you should not miss. 
And I say we missed those steps because soon people knew all these things about leadership. They were going for all these programs. They were starting businesses and all of that. But something came from their past and just bit them, you know, and drew them back and destroyed their leadership. And so I want to introduce you to this diagram. What we need is an authentic leadership roadmap, which starts from the core, the center, self-awareness. Because now without self-awareness, you don't even know, you don't even know your, your strengths. Then you are not going to lead authentically. You need to know your strengths. You need to know your weaknesses. You need to know your opportunities. You need to know your, the things that threaten your leadership. You need to know your family background, your genogram, and how that affects the way you do leadership, how that affects how you act under pressure. You need to know, there are about 18 things I can list that you need to be self-aware of. Now, for, if any of you haven't taken a personality test, not the free ones online, that's a good place to start, but a proper personality test, the a behavioral test that helps you discover who you are. Maybe you should talk to, to Ralph and we can organize something, all right? Because you've got to know who you are, your gifts, your identity, your purpose, and all of that. And then free yourself up the th from the things that will stop you from becoming a great leader. That's the problem with all many of those who are sitting at the African Union, all right? It, because if you have a problem with money and you're not self-aware and you don't deal with it, you don't satisfy your needs emotionally and you don't free yourself from the things that ent will entangle your vision, guess what? You become the leader of Cameroon or the leader of Morocco or whatever it is, become the leader of the AU and you mess things up because money comes and bites you and takes everything crumbling down. The biggest, the best advice I can give you young people is discover who you are. Discover who you are and start working on that. Because guess what? You have 30 years from now to 2050. If you build right, it'll last. As you learn leadership, I want to encourage you to have a balanced diet, okay? Read the classics. Because the leadership does not just come from a desire to make a change. We have a sacred responsibility to lead as human beings. That's what we were made to do. Right from the beginning, God made man and, and woman and said, take care of the earth, lead. We have a sacred responsibility. You know, and you read through the, all the classics, you know, including Greek, you know, Aristotle, you know, Socrates and all of those. They talk about this sacred call we have to lead. All right. So explore that, the origin and objective of leadership. You know, I, my primary source is the Bible, you know, but there are all these other sources that corroborate what scripture says, okay? Develop your character. That is the heart of leadership. Competence without character is a disaster waiting to happen. It always happens. It's just a matter of time. Develop character. Stop lying. Stop cheating during exams. If you cheat during exams today, you will cheat when you become president, when you become minister. Character is the heart of leadership. Start developing a rhythm of leadership where you learn to stop and reflect. Many leaders in Africa, especially, don't reflect. If they reflected enough, they'll see that some of the things they're doing must change. You must have a, learn to have a rhythm of leadership where you execute, you plan, you execute, you evaluate. All right? And it gives you power to even do more. Grow communities that are on mission. Thing mission that brings God glory, mission that blesses people, mission that dis vanquishes evil. Okay, the context of your leadership is going to be global diversity. And so, even on this call, there are people joining from Uganda, South Africa, etc. But and I showed you the picture of those that I led with. You know, I, I even have led a, a Chinese church before. That that is going to be increasingly so. The context of your leadership is going to be global diversity. Learn how to interact with other cultures. What does it mean to be on time for a meeting when you're meeting a German? What does it mean to take care of details when you're meeting a Japanese? That is the world we are going to live in because the people you are going to collaborate with are going to be all over the world. Learn to be a citizen of the world. Okay? Some of our leaders, they go to meetings and they keep looking around like this. They're like villagers who have gotten to New York City. No, not with you. Okay? Rub, rub shoulders with your colleagues around the world because global diversity is the context of leadership now. And then continuing development, all right, in a diverse community, diversity in gender, diversity in age, diversity in ethnicity. Continue to learn. 
The leaders of tomorrow are the learners of today. The leaders of tomorrow are the learners of today. And even tomorrow, you will still be learning. So long as you don't stop learning, you have what it takes to lead in 2050 and in any generation. The day you stop learning, you have lost your right to lead. And then finally, learn organizational dynamics. Because wherever two or three together, you have an organization. And you've got to learn how to run organizations. Organizations have cycles. You know, you've got to learn how to run meetings. You've got to learn budgets. You got to, they are what is called organizational dynamics. They're not taught in school usually, unless you're, doing business, you're in business school. But learn these things. You know, so that you can run not just your life and your family, you can run organizations, you can run the nations of the world. So I want to leave you with this because leadership develops daily. That's what my mentor says, not in a day. And so every day as you do something to grow in leadership, like today, you come, come 2050, people look at you and say, wow, this guy is an awesome leader. They would not know that you've been in rough seminars, that you've been with GMAC, that you have been in NIS seminars, that you've been reading books and things like that, you know, because leadership develops daily, not in a day. So I wish you growth. I wish you success, but not just success for yourself. I wish you significance that, that affects other people, especially for the African continent. If you want any further information, you can contact Ralph or you can send me a, a, an email at info at and, and I'll be happy to, to help you with the tools that you need to become the leader that you need to be. So thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to look into the future, all right, uh, in all these areas of life. And remember that a leader is a person who influences people to achieve a noble purpose. God help us. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pebby.